there's just so many tequila lies and there's so much garbage and it's so and you're doing it dude you're hitting it on the head you're calling on the regular i just made a hundred million dollars baby and we're just going to do it a hundred percent no you pick the apple today it's sour it's bitter it's hard grandma has to do what more vanilla more sugar you wait two more weeks on that apple that apple's crisp and the same looks like the same apple but now it's right i got to have an incredibly open and honest conversation with guy fieri i've always been a big fan of guy my diners drive-ins and dives is my wife and i's like vacation show but what really made me become a fan of his was his work for restaurant workers during the pandemic i don't want to get too much into it now because we do cover it later in the conversation but then you might also know me as the guy who talks about celebrity tequilas and i even said this it feels like every celebrity and their mother has a tequila out today. And you even have some real heavy hitters like Guy Fieri launching their own tequila brand. And then after that video, I had a lot of you guys who watch commenting saying, hey, but Guy Fieri and Sammy Hagar Santofino is actually really good. It's added a fee. You should really check it out. And so eventually I did oblige. I got myself a couple of bottles and tasted them. I then posted this video where I drank and ranked every single celebrity tequila out there. And Santofino was the one that I enjoyed the most. And to my surprise, shortly thereafter, I was able to have this conversation with Guy. But let's back up and just talk about this brand of tequila just for a moment. Santofino is a brand of tequila that is owned and created by Guy Fieri and Sammy Hagar. Big famous rock star guy? Yeah, him. And Sammy Hagar had a brand called Cabo Wabo that he ended up selling that was probably, I think, the first celebrity tequila out there. They have five different expressions of tequila. You have their Blanco, their Reposado, Inanejo, and they even have an 110% ABV still strength Blanco. And they even have something called Mezquila, which is uh, their hybrid of a Blanco tequila and Mezcal. And all of these expressions hail from NAM 1107. And they are confirmed part of the Additive Free Alliance, meaning they are confirmed Additive Free by Tequila Matchmaker. And that last part right there is really important because I can already hear you typing, wow, Louis, you're such a sellout talking about a celebrity tequila. I bet he paid you. So a couple of things. One, this is not paid by Santo Fino in any way, shape or form. All they did was offer to set up a conversation with Guy Fieri. And two, I think that while there are so many examples of celebrities out there making really terrible tequila, I think that we should showcase the ones that are doing it the right way. But we also didn't just talk about tequila in our conversation. We covered a whole host of topics that I think are really interesting and you should stick around for. Just something very small that I want to tell you guys. Unfortunately, we had a little bit of technical difficulties in setting up the video portion of this. So unfortunately, the video quality is not the greatest. I do apologize about that, but I guarantee you the stuff we talk about is worth listening to. So sit back, pour yourself a glass of tequila and enjoy. Hey, uh, let's start exactly where it matters. I've been very vocal and critical of uh, celebrity involvement in tequila. What are your thoughts on celebrities in tequila and what brought you to want to invest in and, to, and be a part of a tequila brand and what it is that you were trying to do? So, well, one, thanks for the platform, okay? Because this isn't in the normal uh, profile of how I see you doing your social media and how you're talking about stuff. So to get a chance to say something, I don't feel like I'm defending. I just, I respect what you're saying. So this was kind of like a, let's have a meeting of the minds. I don't have any shame in the game. People can go make money doing whatever they want to make, as long as they're not hurting themselves, right? But my thing about the tequila business is I've always been a tequila fan. And my joke always was when I was in college, I thought I was allergic to tequila because every time I drank it, I broke out in handcuffs. Um, <laughs> but I was. But the thing was, is tequila back then, and I think I've got a few years on you, so I don't know that you were in this era of te tequila, but tequila back then was only Cuervo. So when I had my first restaurants, Chicani Garlics up here in the wine country in Northern California, uh, everybody knew that I was a big Sammy Hagar fan. And uh, this, the sales rep comes in and says, hey, Sammy Hagar makes tequila. And this is even before there was any celebrity brand or anything. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm not, I'm not into people's you know, endorsement deals. I'm not buying it because of that. She goes, no, really, Sammy Hagar's making this tequila. He has a place down in Mexico. He's a big tequila. He's making that. I go, that's bullshit. She goes, hang on a second. Pick up the phone and put Sammy Hagar on the phone. Now, I've never met Sammy. You only see him at the concerts and so forth. And he's... What you see is what you get. Sammy is as transparent as there. And he's a great chef, actually, believe it or not. I think when you're an artist, you're good at anything. And he tells me about it. And he walks me through. And I knew enough about tequila that, you know, I didn't know as nearly as much as I know now. So, anyhow, he goes through this whole thing. So, I said, okay, I'll bring the tequila in. And it was fantastic tequila. And I'm like, wait a second. So, then I became one of the number ones, you know, restaurants selling it. That led into my friendship with Sammy. That led into, then I go and get in TV. And I didn't have anybody to call when I got into TV, except for the one rock star guy. I know, like, hey, man, do I get an agent? Like, what, you know, what's happening? So, 
So Sammy's like a big brother to me. I'm a big fan of Cabo Wabo. I'm selling a bunch of it. I've I've got some collector bottles I still have that you know that, that Sammy gave me that are dated here, you know, in the box only. So he calls me one day, Luis. He calls me. I'm I'm shooting in Bainbridge, Washington, out on an island doing triple D. And when your phone comes up and it says Red Rocker, answer the phone. God bones. Because every time Sammy talks, it's like he's talking at a concert. Yeah, man. Hey, listen, good news and bad news. I'm like, okay, what's the good news? I just made a hundred million dollars, baby. <laughs> okay, what could be bad? I sold Cabo Wabo. I said, Sammy, no, 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 you can't sell Cabo Wabo, dude. That's your brand. They made us now. They made me a deal I couldn't turn down. So I said, hey, Sammy, do me a favor. If you ever get in the tequila business again, I want in. Never going to happen. Never gonna happen. I said, well, he says, because I have to sign a deal. Ten years. I said, Sammy, ten years is gonna go like that. Twelve years later, wait, he calls me. I'm here at my house. We're building a fence. And he calls me. And this is how Sammy, it's very cryptic. Got bones. Yeah, what's up, Sammy? You win? Yeah, for what, Sammy? You win, yes or no? I said, Jesus. I mean, I, like, I don't have time for this shit. I'm, you know, it's hot. And we're trying. He go, I go, yeah, Sammy. He goes, great. Sammy, $250,000. We're in the tequila business, baby. I'm like, what? Yeah, we're making mezquila. I'm like, what the? What is mezquila? He goes, you know, when you drink the mezcal, you don't like it, do you? And I said, no. He says, good. We're gonna make it. To, it's got the smokiness, but it's clean. Da, 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 da. And that's how it started. So I call my manager, Reed. I said, hey, Reed, I think I just got myself into you know the deal that I don't know if I should be doing. I said, Sammy's got this. Wants to do this tequila thing. So it goes right to the very beginning. I was in the wine business at this point. So I'm in wine. Um, we have a little uh, estate pinot that we're making. We're doing really well with it. And I'm like, you know what? I don't need to do shit that I don't really have a relationship with. So my deal with Sammy is, what are we going to make? I said, I don't want to make the sugar water that's out there. And don't get me wrong. Sugar water tequila did a tremendous amount, in my opinion, for our industry. Because it made people realize, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm a tequila fan. Oh, I like tequila. I like that big bottle that comes out of the club. Okay? Don't get me wrong. That got things started. At least it got some momentum. And now what's happened is people have started to realize, well, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so that one makes me hungover. That one doesn't. What is tequila lies? What, what is this thing about thing being no additives? No additives is the most unsexy term to ever brand anything, but it's all we got. <laughs> yeah. So I said to Sammy, I said, what are, what are we going to make? And he says, we're going back to Juan Eduardo, who made my tequila back in the day, third generation. And we're just going to do it 100%. No bullshit. I said, how much are we going to do? And he goes, what? Let me ask you, why do you want to be in this? I said, Sammy, because I love tequila. And I said, I would love to be involved in something with you, but I only want to do things as a chef. And in the, you know, in the honesty of what I do with diners, drivers, and I'm a fake triple D. I mean, I'm a lot like you, man. If I like it, you'll know it. If I don't, you'll hear it. You know, and if I hate it, it's never going to hear. I mean, you're not getting up and just completely burying people. I imagine there's some stuff that you've been tasting that you said, it's not even, why, why do I even want to sit here and drag this out? Because it's not great. 100%. Well, I said, Sammy, I said, Sammy, we got to do Blanco. And he's like, no, man, everybody's doing Blanco. Everybody's doing Blanco. I said, well, we can't be in the game only with mezquila, half mezcal and half Blanco, which is dynamite, by the way. I'm a big fan of it because I do like the little taste of the smoke. I'm a cigar guy also. I'm a cigar guy. I like smokiness. I just don't like to lick the entire ashtray. All right? Some of it just goes too deep for me. So anyhow, I make this. I said, okay, listen, man, if we've got great Blanco, if it's 100% Blue agave, if it's the Weber blue agave, and that's all it is. And we're picking it ripe, and you know the difference between on this. I just, this is how I explain to everybody when I do my tequila explanations. The pina will grow this big in six years, and it'll grow that big in eight years. So why wait two more years? This is what I've explained to everybody. I said, why wait two more years? Because that's when it's going to ripen. Because yep. if it doesn't ripen, then what you have is sour mash, not sour mash that now you have to kiss or fix or adulterate or add to because it's not. So here's my example. Grandma makes an apple pie. You pick the apple today, it's sour, it's bitter, it's hard. Grandma has to do what? More vanilla, more sugar. You wait two more weeks on that apple, that apple's crisp and the same, looks like the same apple, but now it's ripe. And so that's what I, we try to describe and try to explain to everybody. And that's where Sammy and I work with it is picking ripe fruit, handling it the right way, and the Blanco was awesome. You could taste the agave. You could get your, there was nothing added to it. I'm like, come on, man, we got to do this. Okay, we'll try it. So we did it. We got some great response. I said, well, listen, if we got the Blanco going, you know, all we got to do, put it away for a few months, get a little repo going. 
So it was literally like this stepping stones of two brothers trying to work through the deal. Well, all of this goes along. Things are going fine. We've got this crazy old style Spanish bottle and you know, the explanation of how, you know, where do you find cool controlled spaces in Mexico? There's not a lot. So if you're right. going to get a place like that, you're going to have to capitalize on your, on your space. Right. So that was the bottle. We didn't hand paint it because we're artists. And, you know, this whole thing was going on great. Until we realized that, you know, we should probably get real serious about this. And that's when we brought on uh, Dan Butkus, who's our president. But anyhow, so we get to the Añejo. Now listen to this. We get to the Añejo. It's in the barrel. And it's not coming around. I mean, it's not coming around at all. And we're tasting. We taste every month. It's not coming around. And you know the depletion that you get when you're sitting in a barrel and you're going for, I mean, this is almost two years. Yeah. And so the depletion is, I mean, and so a guy that worked with us, who no longer works with us, said, maybe this one, we help it a little bit. And I said, I'm fucking out. If this is what's part now, I'm going to ignore what record this. I said, if that's, if anybody thinks that this is the decision to do, that we just completely change horses in the middle of the stream. Absolutely not. Sammy wrote back to me in big capital letters. Absolutely not. And so we sat on it. Louise, we sat on it for another six months. Wow. And we didn't come out with it as a double and yeho. We didn't go and make a big promotion about it. We just said, you know what? Our principles were, you know, right, Weber Blue Agave, doing it the right way, same principle, same process. And the fact that maybe the barrel didn't have enough char on it, maybe it just was we got a batch of barrels that, you know, that, that had been already depleted of their ability to mellow. Yeah. I don't know. Right. We wrote it out. And I think what we came out with was dynamite. And the thing is about this whole deal. We're not running around saying, hey, Sammy Hagar, hey, Rockstar, the godfather of tequila, did it before anybody. Hey, Guy Fieri, uh, restaurant owner and, and, and guy the elite, you know, loves his restaurant industry, raises money. We're not playing this shit out. I mean, look on it. You can see my signature is that big. Yeah. And that's the thing that we're trying to tell you. I just was at, talking to IMI, uh, flew all the way to Georgia to meet the 100 influencers that are, you know, writing the majority of these cocktail menus for the industry. And I said, the first thing I want to say to you is, we are not a celebrity branded tequila. Please. My whole thing explained it all to him at the end. Said, the last thing I'd like to remind you, we're not a slut. Listen, people want to make money at anything they can these days. But yeah. one of the things that makes it tough for me, do you really drink tequila? Not you. Do, are you really a tequila drink? I mean, like, is this what you're into? I'm not saying you can't be in the business if you don't do it. You know, I write books. I don't read a lot of them. So I don't think that there's, you know, hypocrisy in that. But I'm saying... Just because somebody says they're into it, maybe you want to buy it off of their brand name. Maybe you want to buy it because you're a fan of them. I don't care. That's fine. Right. Yep. But come try this, 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 and this together, and I will show you the differences. As you do, you're explaining this to people. There's a lot of bullshit. There's yeah. a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of implied benefit. And right. really, if, you want to, if you're really a tequila fan and you're really interested in drinking great handcrafted true tequila here's what we got for you i love it man. for an explanation oh that was great i'm just sitting here in awe and I, and I really appreciate going so in depth and i guess my next question is the folks who are down in mexico producing it you know so you said that they used to work with sammy with cabo wabo how how have their has their family been doing it for many generations kind of what's their backstory so Juan Agar, this is in the highlands of jalisco and juan eduardo uh, is the third generation of, of this family that's doing it. And matter of fact, when Sammy had Cabo, when he had Cabo Wabo, he did it with Juan Eduardo. Well, when Campari came and bought them out, Campari doesn't need little Juan Eduardo. No. Um, we still, our in, our involvement with Juan Eduardo is still to the point of like, do we have enough wagons? You know, like, do, do yeah. we, but where are we at on, you know, are you putting these labels on by hand still? You know, we're kind yeah. of, that thing. This, we went back to Juan Eduardo. That was the whole thing. And Sammy's like, why reinvent the and reinvent the wheel? We've had a lot of proposals to go bigger. Yep. Maybe one day we will expand in that way. But the way I want to expand is investing in where we're doing it currently with Juan Eduardo. Maybe we come to be part ownership or something like that. I'm into the whole thing. I'm going down. Uh, I just built a house in Mexico. And I'm going down for a day to go spend. And I told my team, I want to go down for a week. I want to go from the nursery, I want to go harvest, I want to go feel the pain, I want to be, I want to load it up on the trailers, I want to come down and break it down, I want to go through the, you know, the double, you know, uh, cooking process, I want to take this, you know, 
toast the tits. I want to go right through the whole thing. So we're going down, and I hope Sammy's going to make it. But as a cook, like there's nothing greater. And I, you cook, you go grow a tomato, and you take it, and then you eat it. There's an there's an attraction. There's a feeling. I tell people all the time, yeah. the kids kids that don't like food, or that let them be involved in the harvest of food. Let them feel some of that. You'll change their opinion. So I think they, that's a beautiful sentiment, especially because you know you're clearly chef come from that background of being in the kitchen. I think that, and I try to explain this to people that these are not, you know, when you're talking about liquor, it's th these raw materials, they're not like, you know, they're not these processed chemicals for, for most of the time. If, if it's an agave, it's a actual plant and it has to grow to, like you said, between six and eight years. That's a small child's life. Like that's a thing that grew out of the ground that needed care. It needed love. It needed sunlight. It needed water. It needed soil. It needs all of that to get to this point. And I think your analogy of, you know, growing your own tomato and, and seeing what that's like when you cook it, there is, there is, it's a, it's about that raw product. It's, it's yes, what it ends up being in a bottle is cool. It's great. It's delicious. We all love it, right? There's a reason why we're here, but it's like the same way that if you're, if you're a chef and you don't care about what tomatoes you're putting in your dish, your dish is going to end up tasting, you know, subpar if you're just putting in whatever into it. So it's that thing of like, you get what you put into it. So, and I've always been a very stern believer about it in my kitchen and in our bar where it's like, if you start off with a bar where it's like, if you start off with inferior product. Ice, 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 baby. Yeah. I mean, it, it is my thing that I talk about in restaurant when I used to do consulting before I, when I owned own restaurants and then before TV, I would consult and help people with their restaurants and so forth. And I would bring them back to saying, what kind of drinks are you making? And what kind, how much appreciation are you giving to having an ice filter, a filter on your ice machine? Because I don't give a shit what you're putting in the glass. Right. If you've got bad ice, or if you've got weak ice, if you've got melted ice, you know, cold, crisp ice, you know, I mean, you're, this is your world. But all the different cubes and all the different principles are the reasons why ice does what it does in the drink. Sometimes it is for dilution. Sometimes it is only for, for chilling it down. So whatever it may be. But no, I'm with you on the, the, the raw ingredient. And that's what I'm trying to tell people. I think the thing, well, my question was going to be for you. Where we're seeing the business trend. I'm watching people dropping off. I watched the, play, the prices of agave going up, and now they're you know mellowing out a little bit. We really are looking at trying to buy property in Mexico because I want to. Nothing to me could be more, and it's not bragalicious, but I would love to be farm to table with the tequila, like really have that experience where we planted all of this and we were part of a co-op. But we, yeah. and, but where do you see? Are we going to run out? Not of tequila. Are we going to run out? Is the game going to stop? And we're just going to filter out, no pun intended, and come to the truth. We always going to have this game, the big flashy models. But where do you well, see it? That's an, a super interesting question. And I and I've spoken with a couple of other content creators who talk about tequila quite a bit. And one of the things that I've kind of, tr I know that a lot of us have tried to make kind of our mission is to really help educate, right? Because like you said, when we were talking about restaurants earlier, I, I, and we were talking about you know, my restaurant, it's about education. It's about getting people to understand what it is that is going on. Because um, I think that with liquor, it's a lot of people find it, uh, it, it's not as approachable to understand because it's very technical. I'm, I'm super nerdy about it. I'd love, we can sit here and talk about, you know, the angel share in a, in a, in a, in a, in a barrel and I'll love it, right? Like stuff that most people would just go right over their heads. And so I think that what I've been trying to do is really try to make it bite-sized pieces, make it interesting so that we don't uh, go full circle. And what I mean by that is like, I hope that right now we're seeing so many brands out there and not just celebrity owned brands, even some, everybody and their mother who has some money is now getting in, in, in business of tequila. And you don't have to be in the, the select, like you don't have to have a, a very large following to do this. Um, and I think that there's a lot of really bad product being produced on mass because everyone's trying to capitalize on this torrential wave of, of, uh, love for tequila and it's in the center right now. I mean, I, you you definitely know this, but a lot of people who might be listening to this might not know that tequila sales are on, on pace to outsell bourbon in the US, which is has never happened. Nothing has ever outpaced bourbon outside of vodka, obviously, but it's, so that's one of those things that, what I'm hoping is that we don't go into the space where it's like, you know, every it, it's now super saturated again and everybody gets introduced into the less, uh, quality brands once again, just because they're like, oh yeah, everyone loves tequila. Let me try, you know, this one that marketed so much, which is really why I do what I do. Hey, listen, you you just hit the nail on the head, and this is the thing: fancy packaging is so difficult for the average consumer 
to look past and say, you know, then you get packaging where they tricked you because then they went made less fancy packaging because they were trying to look authentic. And now that bomb, so wait a second, that one looks kind of rustic. It looks like it was printed by the bad, bad typewriter in Mexico. You know the one I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay, now wait, wait, wait. Is that the authentic one? Or wait a second, maybe this one over here that's a Spanish word I don't know. Is that the one? You know, or is the one in the clay bottle? The one in the clay bottle, that's got to be authentic. You know, and, and this whole game that's being played. So um, I'm with you on it. And uh, I think the other piece that I try to say to people is I know what it takes to make, what it takes to make tequila. And I think we use the best that we can do. And I think we use the most authentic methods. And I know what it costs. It does not cost $150 a bottle. So my thing is don't get baited into price. Get baited. Buy it. Drink what you like. That's what I tell people all the time. Don't worry about the reviews and all that kind of thing. Just drink what you enjoy. But also understand what you're getting into. And I think that's the cool thing that you've been doing. And there's a few of you guys that there's some that are softer on some that are on it. But I think you shoot it up the middle and you make it, you just, you said, you make it palatable for people. Like you give them the, enough of the nerdy, then you give them enough of the ha ha. You know, you, you put some humor into what you talk about and then you give it but the, you know, perspective. I think that's a great way to be an ambassador of tequila and help people. Do you do this with other booths too or just tequila? I, well, I do. I have. And I really, uh, I, before I ever made videos about tequila, I was focusing on cachaca and other South and Latin American spirits. No one cares. That's just the truth of it. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, you can look through my YouTube video. I have videos that I, you know, sat and talked about, like, what Pisco is and what Cachaca is. And so it, it comes from a genuine place of wanting to understand and wanting to share what I know and wanting to talk about this, you know, from ground to bottle for, for all of the, the spirits that I really love. And the ones that I focus on in my bar and restaurant, because that's what we're trying to do through education and through the our cocktail menu and what we're doing. But what ended up happening was is that because of this torrential wave of support and love for tequila, those are the videos that start to really have a lot of traction. And so, you know, I try to make other content and no one listens. And so it's, it's, you end up at a point where you're like, well, I'm going to make what I, I want to make, but also what people want to watch. Because that's, as someone who, you know, you make TV shows, I create content, you, you have an audience and you have to feed that audience. And obviously we can, I try and change things up and I try to go a different way. I have a couple of groups. Yeah, you know the thing that I, I, I don't know you yet, but I'm reading this. If you don't know something, I imagine you're the guy that says, hey, I don't know all that about that. Let me figure it out. Let me go do some research. I'll come back to you. Let me tell you what I think I found out or what I was believing. Yeah. And I think that that truth in it, because one of the things I say about it as a chef, and I tell this to young chefs all the time, as soon as you come into the reality that you are on a quest where you will never see the ending, that is when it really blows it. That's when you really expand your mind to realize that this is really a, a journey of knowledge and curation. And, you know, and that's what makes it so exciting. But don't ever think that like, okay, you know, I completed it. So therefore I am now a master. You know, my buddies have become wives only, a master wife only. You know, they're the ones who'll tell you this. That's when they really kind of lose their mind to the reality yeah. of never going to know. Them. Yeah. And, and, and I always like to that point, people always say, oh, like I, I you know, they'll say things like, oh, like I'm a tequila expert. I'm like, no, I'm not. And I always push back because I'm like, there is way too much to know about all of this that I am not an expert. I am someone who owns a bar and I'm just trying to share the information that I get to know. And then it's changing. Then it's changing yeah. on you and who is emerging and where it's coming from and what are they doing and how did it get different and, and, and how much do we really know about what's happening? You know, it's like this thing going on with this additive free. The, the, what's our, our symbols this big? You know, it's, it's no organics golden label like you get in some, you know, it's, it's, a, it's as sexy as saying non-GMO. Yeah. I mean, but that's what it's called. And I, you right. know, it's additive free. And I, when I tell people that have never heard it, they look at me like, that's the sales pitch, huh? Additive free? Like, wow, you really wouldn't pay below. And I'm like, no, no, let me explain to you why, though. Because it's right. real. And then once they get it, they're like, really? 51%? So I can, people can do other. One thing I, my wife and I, when we started dating, we went down, we took a vacation and our vacation show was diner drive-ins and dives. And it was, it's so funny that she told, she told me, like, you need to mention it to him, how that show is just, I loved it. I fell in love with it because you always were so upfront in that show. And like you said, it, it was so natural and it was such a huge part of our relationship. My wife and I is that like, it was amazing. Uh, and so along that, if you have time for one more question, my last question that, was, that- you know, Going back to the roots of you know being a chef and restaurateur, this is a selfish question on my part. Uh, what is the future of 
restaurants. And, and the reason why I phrase it that way is that I, we live in this crazy world now where technology is taking over everything and people are becoming more and more isolated and everybody has their, you know, you don't have to interact with anybody that you don't want to. Some people just literally never leave their home anymore. It's this crazy thing, right? And I have this theory that restaurants are going to become even more important as restaurants and bars. They'll become even more important than they ever have been. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on like the future of restaurants, how restaurants can kind of integrate with technology or not integrate with technology. What do you think is going to happen? Great question. And it is the question of the industry and of the future. When the pandemic hit, I was in this kitchen and I knew what was happening to my brothers and sisters. A lot of my restaurants were big enough and we have a lot of insurance and we were able to, we said, don't get me wrong, it hurt really bad. But I know my mom and pop restaurants, I know guys like yourself and your wife, and you're grinding it every day. You're open to close, you're all these guys. And I'm going, we've got walk-ins full of food. We got people counting on paychecks tomorrow. We got we got banquets booked. We got, you know, and we're gonna pull the plug on people when we close these restaurants. So I went and raised a bunch of money. I went to all the big industries out there. Uber Eats, Cargill, you name it. I went to them and I said, Hey, listen, our industry's gonna get hit hard, and it's it, it's the restaurant workers. And you've been doing great on everybody, you know, selling your product. Let's get some money. So I sat right here, made these videos on a Sunday, sent them to my attorney who knew all the big CFOs and CEOs of all these companies. And everybody's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm sending these videos telling people about money. And this is what I'm going to do with them. And so we did that. And uh, the next morning, Pepsi called. And my manager's like, Reed's like, did you send out some videos to people? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I got Pepsi on the phone and they want to give you a million dollars for something. What the, you know, what's going on? Idiot. Our industry needs to unify. Our industry can't go backwards. Yeah. Let's not cheapen the game. Let's not be worse. Let's be better. Let's hold standards. Let's educate the consumer. Let's be the best we can be. That's what Triple D is about. Is I go around to these places and I'm trying to say, hang on. It's not the glitz and glamour. It doesn't have the big sign. It doesn't have the best frontage. It's not on the beat path. It's down here. It looks like your old house. Yeah. But you're going to go in there and you're going to get authenticity. Yeah. And you're going to get story. And you're going to get. So the funny thing is, Lisa, I'll go to a restaurant and uh, I'll eat there, you know, I'll do a triple D. And I'll look at the owner and I'll say, Do you know that the property values in this area just went up? They'll look at me. I said, because this egg roll is so damn good that people are going to want to move here just to eat it. And I really mean what I'm saying because who doesn't say this? Uh, where are you going to move to? What are the schools like? Any restaurants around there? You know, what are the grocery stores like? That's what people yeah. So the fact is the question, where's the industry going? We had a lot of fallout after the pandemic and lost great restaurants. And we lost some restaurants that should go away. Maybe some restaurants that weren't holding up, you know, that weren't doing the job they should. So now we're kind of, I don't know if we're stabilizing, but now we're facing so many of these new things that are coming up, minimum wage. You know, there's some big stuff going on in the, in the fast food industry uh, for the minimum wage game that's going on. I think that the future is great. I think that it's going to be, it's going to change though. And we're going to have to get smarter in the game technologically. Yeah, I think that's going to be a piece of it. I think having the ability to, you know, how many restaurants still write hard tickets and how many restaurants uh, go to go to computerization. The computer game now is amazing. I'm helping some friends of mine own a, open a burger joint, and they're so tech. There's a there's a company. Which I think it's 350 bucks a month. All they have to do is buy the iPad. It interfaces to the computer. They can take online orders. It interfaces with DoorDash and Uber Eats, and it does their whole thing and gives them their accounting and is their cash register for 350 bucks. Right. I don't remember that. Mine was an NCR. You know, you had to have all these tech. You know, and, and, yeah. and anybody to work on it, you were dead. You know, you've been in the business long enough. And it, and not everybody could afford. Um, I don't know the names of the companies anymore. They're open table. Not everybody can afford it. So there right. is. So people got to. We're gonna have to get a little. I don't say get smarter on the game, but I think people do have to start looking at these other avenues uh, to go food. I mean, how many restaurants used to not do to go or delivery? Delivery is such a pain in the ass. You now you've got to have it. I mean, I'm building. You have to have them. I have a chicken concept called Chicken Guy. I don't know how we came up with the name. But when we're building these, we're building them in the 40 20 30, or the, 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 the uh, 60 20 20 rule. 60 20 20? 20 60 20? Yeah. And doing 20% of our footprint for delivery drivers. Whoa. You can't have 
people coming in trying to order and get their stuff and then have this delivery yeah. driver sitting in line. He doesn't have time for that. And I also need this family that's coming in to get something from Chick Bay being, you know, behind five delivery drivers. So, listen, I think that when you've got a business like yours, you're doing nothing but promoting your business through your medium that you have, which is awesome. You should talk about it more. I mean, if I, so I'm a big marketing guy. This is my cigar company, uh, Knuckle Sandwich. Um, I didn't have this here to promote the, the FMB. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm not the only person that's asking you this question of where are you. And the thing is, why not show us your restaurant in the shop? Why not put your name in a sign? You can buy those really cool neon signs now. That's, wait, we have signs. I just, the way that it's set up, I'll even move my camera to, so, to I show you. I mean, I watch it. Yeah, so, I mean, like, there is the sign on the wall. Right, that we have, and then over there, oh, sorry, we also have like the logo on a wooden uh, thing that my brother-in-law and I did. But it's because usually my bar, I share, set that. Up. share that with us. Yeah. I, I'm thirsty for the knowledge, especially. I don't know. I mean, I know a little bit about Brazilian food, but not as much as I think you could tell us. Market and sell it. I tell people all the time, how good is your website? How strong is your website? We're going to put you on Triple D. We're going to put you on Triple D Nation. We're going to have you come and compete on guys' grocery games. People are going to look you up. When they look you up, are they going to come into this clunky old website that doesn't work? Or can they go and buy a t-shirt? Can they go and buy a, a set of the tasting glasses that you use? you got to remember, there's millions of people that are rapid fans about what you're doing. Man, I'm telling you, there's so much business out there for people in our industry. They just need to play. I'll give you one. Don't get me started on shit like this. So when the pandemic happened, I did a show called uh, Diners, Drivers, and Dives to Go. And what I did is I, I went to a bunch of my brothers and sisters that I'd already shot the show with. Food Network needed material. The, the whole industry had shut down. So out here on my outdoor kitchen, Hunter and I, and Ryder, my youngest, we had a bunch of GoPros from dirt biking and stuff. So we set up the GoPros, and we made a show about our friends sending us their food. And because they were going to go, so most restaurants were going to go. And then I would cook the food here, like we were at Triple D, and taste the new recipe from Panini Pete. That's really cool. We did 18 episodes. And the thing was, is we have restaurants now, like Keste, which is this famous Italian, uh, famous pizza joint down in, uh, in New York. He sells 400 pizzas a day. Wow. Frozen, shipped around the country. Wow. So, Annie, back to your question. Yeah, the industry's there. And fortunately, someone like yourself, you've got a really good platform already to do it. But we have got a market. We have got to expand. We have got to have diversity. We have got to educate ourselves. We've got to be into the, you know, it's not just, I'm open. I cooked, here you go. Now, now it's, there's a, there's a, just like the tequila business. It's not Sammy Hagar back in, you know, the 90s, where it's like, I'm Sammy, and here I'm making great tequila, and it's on the shelf. All he was competing against was Cabo. And there you have it. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Guy. I think he's a super down to earth dude and it was really great to get to chat with him. But if you want to know what I think about other celebrity tequilas, you can watch this whole video right over here next.